Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to revisit this post from President Nelson. It's his New Year's Day post. I already did a video about it, um, but I got an email that may shed more light on uh, the significance of why he posted this for his uh, New Year's post. Now, why do I even care? Well, the reason why is because I've noticed that each year of his presidency, his very first post of the year seems significant, like really significant for the year. So for example, uh, here's his very first post. This is on January 17th, 2018. Just a few days earlier, he became president of the church. And in the third paragraph, he says, to you who are young, please know that you were born for this time. You are a chosen generation foredetermined by God to do a remarkable work, to help prepare the people of this world for the second coming of the Lord. We need your strength and faith. And then just a few months later, after General Conference, he had the Worldwide Youth Devotional, which that by itself was a singular event. It wasn't just any uh, devotional. Uh, that's where he introduced the concept of the Lord's Youth Battalion, and that's been a, a running theme of his presidency and uh, the missionaries of this generation that are, that are going on their missions right now during his presidency. So uh, he starts off talking about the second coming and preparing the world for the second coming. Okay, so that was 2018. And then in 2019, uh, just a couple months before, Paradise, California had burnt down. And we've talked about the significance of that. Paradise, California burnt down. He went there and visited it. Uh, it was the first thing that he posted about in 2019. And then three months later in April at General Conference, he uh, gives that talk, which is like the central talk of that pattern that I've shown before where it's like the middle talk. And in that talk, he says, time is running out. After he warns about the consequences of um, of not being worthy, you know, at, at the time that we depart this life, not being worthy and how that's going to impact our future and those that we remain sealed to or, or not, if you're not worthy. And um, it was a big warning. He, he said time is running out and he showed pictures of Paradise, California in his talk. Right. And what's interesting is that uh, this last general conference, the October 2023 general conference, it was basically the same talk. He quoted the same quote um, in that talk. We just went over that in a recent video. He gave uh, the same warnings. <coughs> and what happened was three months after or a few months after that, that's when Paradise Chile burnt down. So you had Paradise, California, and then he, and then there's the general conference where he talks about it. And then October, 2023, he gives a, like a parallel sister talk. He announces the temple for that area, for Viña del Mar, Chile, where the fire is in the region of Paradise or Valparaiso, Valley of Paradise. He announces that temple and then that area burns down. So it's like Paradise fire warning talk. Warning talk, paradise fire, like that. So anyway, uh, this was his first post of 2019. For 2020, a painting of the of the sacred grove. He says, it is your personal preparation that will help April's general conference become for you not only memorable, but also unforgettable. The time to act is now. This is a hinge point in the history of the church, and your part is vital. And we all know that that conference, was, it, was, it was different. He, he said it was different. He called it a hinge point of, in the history of the church. He talked a lot about it. It was, it was yeah, it was one that we should all remember. It, it was not just another general conference, I don't think. Okay. And then in 2021, uh, here you go. Uh, this was going on and everything that it brought with it. Right. That was the major thing, both for 2020 and for 2021. OK, 2022. Nothing in particular with this one other than, you know, he's looking up and that's something that a lot of people are going to be doing at the time of the second coming. But um, not so much anything with this. But then uh, for 2023, you have him deep sea fishing, which the first time that I saw this, I immediately thought of this you know, Christ making the apostles fishers of men. 
And I feel like this goes along uh, with the Lord's Youth Battalion in this, what I think is uh, a final missionary push before the Second Coming, and this uh, spike of missionaries that we've talked about. There's been three, from what I can tell, three main spikes where we've had an influx of missionaries. The first one was 2002 with President Hinckley at 61,000. And then when Pre- when President Ma- Monson lowered the mission age, there was that uh, spike in 2014 where we got up to 85,000. And then it went down from there. And then there was the pandemic that affected missionary work. And now the next spike, and uh, this may not even be uh, uh, the maximum range of this spike, uh, we're at 72,000. <laughs> excuse me. And so I think that he has this on the mind. Look at this column right here. This is um, part of my phrase tracker that I have that I brought over to this, uh, which specifically has to do with missionary work. And we have this concept of the rising generation. Uh, In 2023, the the phrase rising generation showed up in four general conference talks. But when you go back, like you see how it's all solid right here, like every single year, Um, It's used in at least one general conference talk. When you go back in time, not so much. There's a lot more uh, white space. Uh, It's brought up, you know, semi-frequently, but something really happens when it comes to talking about the rising generation starting in 2006. From 2006 until now, uh, this is like a solid like concept, like a something that they're really thinking about. I think it has everything to do with this lowering of the mission age, Lord's Youth Battalion, um, President Nelson's request for more missionaries. You know, in 2022, he talked about uh, this being the last half of the ninth inning. I, th- I think it's the final wave of missionaries. Think about the last general conference, the talk about like talking about the last wagon, you know, in rescue teams to to bring in the stragglers, the ones that are the, the last that were to come to the Salt Lake Valley. I think that's what's going on. Right. So anyway, so, yeah, him deep sea fishing, the last wagon, getting the last ones before the second coming. And then here we have Machu Picchu. And uh, I'm going to show you the email that I got. I didn't notice this until I got the email. He's wearing this hat that says Machu Picchu, but I I didn't really pay attention to the fact that it says Cusco underneath that. And uh, this post may have more to do with Cusco than anything else. So let's get into that. Uh, Well, before we do, here's uh, the Flood the Earth Challenge. Um, I haven't updated it since the last video, but... We're at 8,164 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared, and then 879 people that have joined the challenge. We're trying to get to 1,000 that have joined, and 10,000 copies of the Book of Mormon shared. So keep it up, everybody. We're, we're making progress every single day. Just keep doing it. Remember, the channel goal is to try to individually, each of us, share at least 10 copies of the Book of Mormon, but uh, don't stop there. And then we also have three... Uh, we have three new reports of people meeting with the missionaries. So that that's really good. Uh, that makes four so far for February and um, 121 total uh, since we started the challenge. So good job, everybody. Keep it up. Okay, so here's the email. I got it from uh, Christina Niklicek. She says, hi, Jared. I hope you see this email. My husband interviewed last month his mission president, Brent Pratt Thomas, and he has a wonderful testimony about Cusco, where Machu Picchu is. I'm attaching the videos of the interview uh, for you to get the story. And then she tells like the key parts of the story, which we're going to read in just a minute. And then later she says, this will answer your question about why Machu Picchu is so special or why, yeah, why it's so special, and probably why it was on President Nelson's first message of the year. Also because it is one of the seven wonders of the world. Please see, please see this, Jared, with praying hands, and share it. Thanks. Well, I did, and and, and we're doing it. Thank you, Christina, for sending this in. And uh, yes, Machu Picchu, uh, it's one of, uh, out of the new, the new seven wonders of the world, because you have the, like the ancient seven wonders of the world, but the new seven wonders of the world, um, 
along with, you know, the Great Wall and in other places, Petra, we have Machu Picchu right here. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do first is, um, so it turns out that her husband uploaded this to YouTube. And so you'll, if you want to watch this yourself, I'll put the link for it in the description box below. This is the, the mission president that's telling a story about uh, like one of the first mission pres presidents in that area and a very special experience that has to do with Cusco. And uh, yeah, man, it's interesting. You'll see. Um, I wanted to see if I could like validate this in any other way. Not that I don't believe him or, you know, Christina's wife or Christina. It's just, I like to see if there's any, anything else to validate it. And, uh, it turns out there kind of is. So there's this, uh, paper or article. This is on, um, BYU's website, religious education, religious study center. Uh, and this is called Peru fulfilling the prophecies by Mark L. Glover. Okay. So if you come down here, it says the time, however, was too short for elder Tuttle. Now elder Tuttle was a 70 and I guess he was like overseeing South America uh, from what I could tell. I didn't do like a really deep dive, but it seems like that's what was going on. So he was in the 70. Okay. The time was too short for him. Uh, like, I guess he had to like move on from South America and move on to something else. And then it says president Sterling Nicolaisen. So this is like the incoming mission president. President Sterling Nicolaisen and his wife Vivian and their three children arrived in Lima on August 31st, 1962. For the next few days, President and Sister Tuttle trained the, the Nicolaisens. Okay, and then later, Elder Tuttle appreciated these concerns but still believed that they could do more with the indigenous peoples. In February 1962, he expressed frustration to the First Presidency that after two years in South America, they were still involved in only limited activities with the Lamanites. During President Hugh B. Brown's visit to Cusco in February 1963, I remember uh, Hugh B. Brown, he was a member of the First Presidency, that's why it's saying President Brown, but this is him right here, okay? Uh, Elder, Tuttle, El Elder Tuttle, oh my gosh, Elder Tuttle expressed his worry over the church in that region. On February 7th, in a Cusco meeting with 67 people, of, of which only 23 were members, President Brown echoed Elder Tuttle's concern. Quote, Although there were many men present in the meeting, there were only a few who seemed to have the quote-unquote Mormon look or seemed to be potential leaders. End quote. Two days later, when talking to the four missionaries in the city, uh, President Brown suggested that, quote, opposition was clearly in evidence and the condition of the people beyond description, end quote. The missionaries needed to continually recognize that the blood of Israel was among the people, and they needed to be searched out. President Brown believed that, quote, Lehi, Nephi, Mormon, Moroni, and others of the prophets who were on the other side were yearning to have their descendants to, to have their descendants hear and to accept the gospel, end quote. He stated that some of the great men and women of the earth were in Cusco. Okay, so this is pretty much what we get from this um, this paper right here, right? But there's actually more to this story, and that's what what he shares. This mission president, what's his name again? It's uh, Brent Pratt Thomas. So he adds to this. This is not the whole thing, and then to finish it off. At the close of this meeting, the missionaries knelt with their leaders and Elder Tuttle, uh, invoked the blessing of the Lord upon the missionaries, Cusco, and the people there, that the Lord would prosper the work and touch the hearts of the people concerning his message. Okay, so, so there is something to this, but it's not the full story. So here's the interview with uh, uh, Brent Pratt Thomas. Sorry, I'm, I'm not good at remembering names. Let me zoom in. I'm going to try and read some of this transcript. Okay, so he says, President Nicolaisen was very concerned that he didn't have enough missionaries for all the sectors that he 
that he had open and was going to have to close something. And because the problems in Cusco, and I mean, and I mean by by that, the fact that they were not welcomed by the members, you know, the local church leaders of the Catholic Church, you know, they were people who would curse them on the street and dump water from the second floor and generally just not be very friendly. And the church had not been growing initially. Um, so, and see, the transcription is never perfect because it's auto-generated. Anyway, President Nicolaisen asked uh, President Brown, so Hubie Brown, if he would if he would help him make a decision about about closing Cusco because it was the most likely candidate under the circumstances. And so, so you know, he's obviously talking about you know he's the mission president. There's like different areas, and uh, he's looking at Cusco and like closing it down at least temporarily because it wasn't doing so well. Uh, I saw that myself on my mission. Uh, there was one place that was temporarily closed down Elda. And then when it was reopened, I was the one that was sent to, to reopen it. And that was a very interesting experience by the way. Um, so anyway, so he was, he was looking at Cusco. Cusco was not looking good. He was thinking about just going ahead and closing that one. Okay. Hubie Brown said, well, let's go to bed tonight. Um, I'll give you my opinion in the morning. And so brother and sister Nicolaisen, um, and I don't recall the other assistant. Okay, so th- the night went by, and it was morning time now. Okay. They were sitting at the breakfast table waiting for uh, Hubie Brown uh, to come down, and he was delayed. And basically, when he did come down, he said to President Nicolaisen, uh, I'm sorry, I did not sleep last night. Okay. I did not sleep last night. I was visited by prophets from the Book of Mormon, and I can't quote the ones. Now, this is uh, him talking. I can't quote the ones. I think um, Carl mentioned a few in particular, but let's just say that it was Nephi, Alma, and Moroni. I don't know. He he just said he was visited. He was visited, but the message was the same. Please, please. So this is from the prophets, the Book of Mormon prophets. Please, please don't take the missionaries out of Cusco. Uh, It is a sacred city. One day there will be a temple there again. And they didn't take the missionaries out of Cusco. Now, uh, you know this is how many years later, uh, 1964, 2,000 years later, 60, okay, sorry, Anyway, he talks about the fact that there's a temple announced for Cusco. So, yeah, currently (coughs) it's not even under construction yet, but you do you do have the Cusco Peru temple that's been announced. And it was announced by President Nelson, the April 2022 General Conference. So that's really interesting. Now, again, this post is from this year. This is not 2022. This is two years later. But two years before, he had announced the temple for Cusco. Now, I want to point out to you that what was said to Hubie Brown was this. Cusco is a sacred city. One day there will be a temple there again. So that obviously implies that at one point, um, the ancient peoples of the Book of Mormon had a temple in Cusco. And that's really interesting. Let's look at that really quick. Let's go to Google Earth. So on Google Earth, here's Cusco right here, right? And then Machu Picchu is like in that region. It's just right up here. Um, It's, uh, they're about 72 kilometers away, or if we do it in miles, uh, only, well, almost 45 miles away. So not that very, not that very far at all. Um, so if if Machu Picchu, let's pretend like if it was an actual modern day city, uh, the Cusco Temple would be the closest one to Machu Picchu. And when when you zoom out, you know you have the other temples in Peru. Here we close out of this. Clear. Um, I'm going to turn off borders and labels. So 
You have this one right here in blue. I have it in blue because it's only announced. It's not under construction yet. And then you have other ones here, but by far the closest one to uh, Machu Picchu is this Cusco uh, temple that's been announced. So that's really interesting. Um, <coughs> now, as far as like the significance, so that certainly is significant. And I don't know, it seems like maybe President Nelson has that on the mind uh, for this year. But why? Well, I don't know exactly, but we have talked about the fact that, you know, when I first saw this picture, and I've seen Machu Picchu plenty of times before, but when I was looking at this picture and with President Nelson there, I was thinking about the Book of Mormon, and I was thinking about all the things that uh, happened to the land, okay? So when we go to Third Nephi chapter 8, it goes through like a whole list of cities and uh, things that, that happened to the cities at the time uh, right before the Savior came to the Nephites after his resurrection. Let me just read a little bit of this. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire, and the city of Moroni did sink into the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants thereof were drowned, and the earth was carried up carried up upon the city of Moroni, and in the place of the city there became a great mountain, and there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward. But behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward for behold, the whole face of the land was changed because of the tempest and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceeding great quakes of the whole earth. And the highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and many smooth places became rough. And many, many great and notable cities were sunk and many were burned and many were shaken till the buildings thereof had fallen to the earth and the inhabitants thereof were slain and the places were left desolate. And then so on and so forth. And then in the next picture, or in the next uh, chapter, uh, this is where the voice of the Lord is speaking to the Nephites. And this is one of the few places that we get a triple woe. Woe, woe, woe. And I just barely did a video about that just a little while ago. How uh, at my state conference uh, that I just had on the day of the Super Bowl, um, we had Elder uh, Hutchins, uh, which is an Area 70 he talked about the fact, or he said that this last general conference was essentially a three woe conference when you take all three talks from the, from the first presidency. And so anyway, you have woe, woe, woe. And then he talks about all these destructions and goes through all these different cities and what happened to them. And so there was like a really big change that happened to the earth. Now, when it comes to Machu Picchu, and Cusco. Um, I looked this up. I wanted to look into their history. Um, and there wasn't much that I could really find it about. So like when, when you research it, most of them would talk about the fact that it goes back to the Incas. Okay. So this would have been after the time of the Book of Mormon. So it's not like Machu Picchu uh, is the remnants of like a Nephite city or Lamanite city per se. Um, let's see, I can't remember if I had something else here. So Machu Picchu may have been occupied around 1420 to, to 1530 AD. So that was much later. That was like a thousand years after the Book of Mormon. Remember the Book of Mormon, um, ended sometime around, or like the ra the last chapter was written sometime around, uh, 421, AD. So we're talking about like a thousand years later in the case of Machu Picchu. And then with Cusco, um, it was just, like I said, it's kind of hard to, hard to say like this Wikipedia article says there's the Kilke culture. The Kilke people occupied the region from 900 to 1200 AD prior to the arrival of the Inca in the 13th century. So you have like an, an earlier people that were in that in that area. We're talking about Cusco. Uh, the, Inca, the Inca later expanded and occupied the complex in the 13th century. You know, um, there's Cusco province. Um, there's this article from worldhistory.org. First habitation of settled populations was actually as early as 500 uh, BC or earlier. And the main pre-Inca settlements were Chanapata. 
So I guess there is like some record of people being there before the Inca and, you know, most likely I, I like, I believe this account. I believe him that, you know, that Book of Mormon prophets visited Hubie Brown and said, no, it's a sacred city. There, there's going to be a, there's going to be a temple there again. Don't give up on them. And, um, so yeah. So in a sense, you could like look at this as, uh, like a restoration. There was a temple there before, and now there's going to be a temple there again, uh, in the near future. A temple has been announced for there. So I think it's part of the ongoing restoration. I also think that, uh, this could call our minds back to the Book of Mormon and the things that preceded the Savior's coming to the Nephites because we're going to see all sorts of uh, destruction take place in the lead up to the Second Coming. There already has been, but we know that there's going to be big changes taking place uh, with the earth. We know that uh, the mountains are going to be made low and the valleys are going to be exalted. Everything's going to become level. And so we're not going to be seeing this anymore. You know, uh, there's not going to be a Machu Picchu or if whatever survives, if anything, uh, it's not going to look like this anymore. This is the old world. This is the world that we're currently in. This is the pre millennial world. And we'll have this to look back at and think about how dramatic the landscape was compared to what things are going to be like in the millennium. So, You know, this could represent a number of different things. It could represent uh, destructions before the second coming. It could represent the uh, restoration of uh, a temple to the Cusco, well, to Cusco. Uh, The fulfillment of that prophecy (coughs) of Hubie Brown, or in reality, the Book of Mormon prophets that visited Hubie Brown, right? These might be key events that need to take place before the second coming, uh, as far for all anybody knows. Maybe it was meant to be that the Cusco Temple is constructed before the second coming, or just uh, around that time. I have no idea, but so it's just it's all really interesting stuff to think about. Um, there was one more thing that I wanted to share. I had shared this before. This is another Hubie Brown story. But it's in President Nelson's book called The Gateway We Call Death, which was published in 1995. Uh, You can access it for free on archive.org, which is an online library. And I just want to read this uh, short excerpt. Okay, so he says, Moving from messages of apostles of the 19th century to those of the 20th, I would like to relate a personal experience with Elder Hugh B. Brown. It It is sacred to me and was also to him. Elder Brown had served earlier as a member of the First Presidency, where, along with countless other matters, he had borne responsibilities related to the building of the Washington Temple. So he's talking about the Washington, D.C. Temple. I suppose that some of the decisions uh, that had been made did not go unchallenged. President Spencer W. Kimball extended an invitation to Elder Brown to attend the dedication As a physician, I had been invited to accompany Elder Brown, now enfeebled due to advanced age. Months prior to his passing on December 2nd, 1975, I received his permission to record this experience from which I quote, quote, on the morning of the temple dedication, President Brown greeted me, Russell M. Nelson, uh, with the news that he had, okay, greeted me, Russell M. Nelson, with the news that he had been visited during the night by President Harold B. Lee. President Lee had died the year before. Elder Brown described it as a glorious visit, one that meant much much to him, for President Lee had been aware of some of of the difficulties encountered by President Brown in the decisions that led to the construction of the temple in Washington, D.C. Later that morning, we took President Brown to breakfast. Sister, Sister Harold B. Lee, Frida Joan Lee, approached us, As we exchanged greetings, President Brown said to her, I had a glorious visit with Harold last night. He is just fine. It was so good to visit with him. This was such a moving experience for us all. We felt the the presence of President Lee's spirit in the temple through the witness of President Brown. And that's it. So 
here we have a couple times that Hubie Brown uh, had been visited in the night by people that had passed on. Um, I'm still searching for, I don't think I have this on my spreadsheets, but there was somewhere that I saw, and this was like in church news or something like that, where President Nelson said that uh, he was, he said he was talking to somebody, I don't know, but he was like, you know, I had a, I had a special visitor last night. So I don't know if like nighttime is just like a good time for, for visits like that because everybody else is, you know, asleep and there's some privacy. I don't know, but it's just really interesting to, to know this story that, you know, they were about to close the Cusco area. He received a visit from those prophets and they're like, no, that's a special area. There's going to be a temple again in that area in the future. And here we are today and it has been announced. So, Anyway, there's probably a lot of things going on here with this picture, but just like just like everything with President Nelson, I don't think he does anything <clears throat> lightheartedly. He doesn't he's very intentional about what he does and uh, especially being president of the church and putting out messages to the world. So, if this picture makes you think about the Book of Mormon and it makes you want to read the Book of Mormon, then great. If it makes you think about all the changes that took place before the Savior came to the Nephites, and then that makes you think about the Second Coming, then great. If this makes you think about this story that we just went over, or, um, well, which I guess nobody really knows. <clears throat> I don't know if this has been recorded anywhere else, but but now we're looking at it, we're hearing this story, and now this does seem to take on more significance uh, after finding that out. It's uh, it's just interesting. I'm all, I I also find it really interesting that again, uh, that President Nelson. So he's only he's only dedicated a few temples. In fact, I should pull up this spreadsheet instead. Let's go to timeline. Uh, temples. Here we go. Let's go down here. Sorry, I wasn't thinking about pulling this up. So the first one he dedicated um, was the Sapporo Japan Temple, but that was before he became president of the church. At the time, he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. That was his first one. But his first one as president of the church was um, Concepcion Chile Temple. So another South American temple, right? And it's Chile, it's in Chile that we just saw this paradise fire in the same place where he just barely announced a temple. So President Nelson, during his presidency, uh, dedicated a Chilean temple. And then he dedicated the Rome, Italy temple. And it, it would make sense that he would want to dedicate that one because of its the history of Rome and what it what it symbolizes and signifies that we have a temple there now after all these years. And he called that event a hinge point in the church. And uh, those are the only temples that he has dedicated himself. So this first one, it may just be because that was the first temple that was dedicated once he became president of the church. Um, the last one was in December of 2017 the Cedar City, Utah Temple by President Henry B. Eyring. But the first one during his presidency, so that's probably why he dedicated that one, but there could be more to that as well. Remember, think celestial. And think celestial. That's where he announced the Vina del Mar Chile Temple. And a few months later, that city, Viña del Mar, in Paraiso, or Valparaiso, that's the city that burned right here. Okay, right there. And the companion or the sister or the parallel talk, I think, is come follow me. Let's go to that. It's the one where he said time is running out. 
And guess what he talked about in this talk at the very beginning? The Concepcion Chile Temple. So in these two sister talks, there's these two Chilean temples. The first one that he dedicated, and then this one uh, announced in a location that just had a fire. And these are the two where he says, let's see, contract, where he reads this quote. All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise are of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection from the dead. For all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. And then here it is here as well in this other talk. So these two talks go together. They both talk about Chilean temples. Um, before the 2019 talk, Paradise, California was burned. After the 2023 talk, Paradise, Chile was burned. So it, it's mind-blowing. All right. Well, thank you, Christina, for sending the email. And thank your husband for me as well. And uh, also uh, Brent Pratt Thomas, uh, if you talk to him really glad that uh he shared that with everybody all right well that's gonna be it for this one so if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and i'll talk to you guys later